He barks. What's another attribute of a dog? Smelly. Possibly. They have four legs. They typically have a tail. They... An attribute is a characteristic. Now, when we talk about communicable attributes, what do we mean? What does communicable mean? Communicable. I understand why somebody would say we understand them, but no. Communicable has the idea of something, it's an attribute that at least in some form is able to be passed on from God to His creatures. So a communicable attribute, what would be an example of one? Love. Love. God is love. We as His creatures have the ability to love. What is an example of a non-communicable attribute? Omniscience. Um, that probably wouldn't be in that category because that is the idea of all-knowing and we have the ability to know. Um, what might be... What's that? Well, we can be holy. Be holy as your Father. What's that? Omnipresence. How about light? God is light. We're called lights of the world. You know... He's eternal. We're definitely not eternal. That would be one that you know we, we can't enter into. Um, as it has been stated, and we spent some time on it, saying that anything is a communicable attribute really is defective when we're, we never ever want to get to this place where we think that something is perfectly reflected in us that's found in God. Because whatever is found in God, whatever we would describe that attribute as, it is eternal in God. It is eternal means from everlasting to everlasting, God had it. We have even existed from everlasting to everlasting. So anything that's true of Him cannot be true of us to the extent it's true of Him. And with Him it's infinite, which means it's all-encompassing. Where God is holy, where God is, is omniscient, where God is omnipotent, we may have some strength. We may have some knowledge. But with God, it's infinite. It has no end. Ours always has a limit. The fact is with God... He's perfect in holiness. He's altogether separate. He is merciful in a way that we are not merciful. He is righteous in a way we are not righteous. We are little flickers of this thing, but we never want to get to the place where we think communicable attribute. Okay, God is love. We have the ability to love. And somehow our love is so filled with defect compared to the love that God has. God's love is abiding with God. God's love is everlasting with God. From everlasting to everlasting, it had no beginning, had no end. It is infinite. I mean, there, it knows no bounds. As God is boundless, it knows no bounds. We have to be very careful that we draw these parallels. And why? Because when it all comes back to it, an attribute is a character. So when we sum up all the attributes of God, what do we have? We have God. We have who He is. We have His nature, right? God's nature and God's essence is basically the summation of His attributes. Everything that's true of God, every characteristic that's true of God, when you sum them all up, what you have is who God is. And what's true of every one of His attributes? Every one of God's attributes is glorious. God is glorious in holiness. We speak about the, the glory of His grace. Every one of His attributes, there's a glory. And what we don't want to do is slight any of His attributes. To leave, Listen, when we have an incomplete picture of God, in other words, when we leave His attributes out of the picture, it, it can be very common to create a picture or paint a picture of God that includes some of His attributes 
but they don't like to include all of them. We have a lot of people that run around today and they say lots of things about God that are true, but they don't like to admit that God is absolutely sovereign in the salvation of man. They don't like to admit that God is the one who throws people in hell, that God punishes. They don't like to admit God has fury. Oh, God is love. They're ready to admit. But you see, what, is it, what does it say in Romans 9? It says that there are vessels of mercy and there are vessels of wrath. Why? And if you go there and read, it's because God reveals Himself through both. And that's what's important. Because you know what? Let me tell you something. God basically created mankind to be a worshiper of God. That means to admire His attributes. To look at who God is, to look at what's true of God, and to worship, and to be amazed, and to be in awe. That's what we're going to do throughout eternity. We're going to just gaze upon what is true of God, His attributes. Okay, here we are to righteousness and justice. Now, here's what Grudem says. Righteousness and justice are different words in English. Okay, in English, you tell me, what does righteousness mean in English? Correct. Right. Righteous. What do we think when we hear righteous? He's a righteous man. What's that? Blameless. A person who does right. A person who, um, I, I think of old, uh, you guys tell me, who's the father of John the Baptist? Zacharias. Zacharias. And who's his wife? Elizabeth. It says that they were righteous. They were, they were those who kept the law. They were blameless. Those are, those are kind of synonymous terms. Righteousness. Now, in English, what do we mean typically when we hear the word justice? You think differently, don't you? You typically don't think the same thing you think of when you think righteous, right? Or do you? You know, we typically don't use that. We typically don't say, well, he's a just man. Now, in the Scriptures, they'll say that. But we'll say he's a righteous man. We typically won't say just. Justice, we think oftentimes about a court of law. But maybe it's not so far removed from righteousness, right? Because what do we say? I want justice or I demand justice. What do we mean by that? What is right? Yeah, it would be what is right. And righteousness has to do with what is right. I'm sure, I'm sure Grudem has something specifically in mind when he's thinking about the differences in English. I, I, we know that difference. I think we feel that difference that... When I hear justice, I think, I think judges, I think courtrooms, I think along those lines. If I hear righteousness, I don't think so much courtroom. I think about a person who lives right. But what he points out, regardless of what we do and how we think of the English, he points out in the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, there's only one word group behind these two English terms. In other words, even though they may be translated into English, righteous or just, in the original they come from the same word group. They basically come from the same uh, word meaning. In the Old Testament, the terms primarily translate forms of the tzedek word group and the New Testament members of dikaios word group. Therefore, these two terms will be considered together as speaking of one attribute of God. God's righteousness means that God always acts in accordance with what is right and is Himself the final standard of what is right. Did you guys all catch that? The righteousness of God means that He always acts right. But who determines what right is? He does. He Himself is the final standard of what is right. So, in other words, that really would be saying God always acts in accordance with Himself. Right? God is the standard of what's right. He declares what is right. And He is never inconsistent with His character. He is never morally inconsistent with who He is. He will never violate 
His character. And, and that character never changes. God is unchanging. Speaking of God, Moses said, all His ways are justice. See, we wouldn't say it like that, would we? We would say all His ways are righteous. But all His ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and right is He. Abraham successfully appeals to God's own character of righteousness when he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So we have God doing right. God also speaks and commands what is right. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. God says of Himself, I the Lord speak the truth, I declare what is right. As a result of God's righteousness, it is necessary that He treat people according to what they deserve. Thus it is necessary that God punish sin for it it does not deserve reward. It is wrong and deserves punishment. When God does not punish sin, it seems to indicate that He's unrighteous unless some other means of punishing sin can be seen. This is why Paul says when God sent Christ as a sacrifice to bear the punishment for sin, it was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to pro prove at the present time that He Himself is righteous and that He justifies Him who has faith in Jesus. When God died to pay the penalty of our sins, it showed that God was truly righteous because He did give appropriate punishment to sin even though He did forgive His people their sins. We're going to deal with that a little more. And I didn't read the whole thing. I didn't even read half of what it says there. But I want you guys to get this idea. God is righteous. Righteousness and justice come from the same word group. So to say His ways are justice or His ways are righteous just means simply this. God always does what's right. He Himself is the standard of what's right. And He never, ever, 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 ever deviates from it. And you see, that's one of the non-communicable attributes of God, which is what? His changelessness. Here it is. His eternality, His infiniteness, and His changelessness. Those are the areas you really want to hit on when we think about what God is that we aren't. And no matter what attribute you bring up, those three things are true of it, which are not true of us. No matter how much we may talk about a communicable attribute, in other words, a characteristic that is in us that we can also identify in God, you remember this about every one of God's attributes. It doesn't change. It never changed. We change. He is changeless. He is eternal. Whatever is true about Him now was true about Him in eternity past and it will be true about Him tomorrow. We eternally aren't the same. Because we at the beginning. And whatever is true of God is infinitely true about Him. I mean, it's infinite in its expanse because He is infinite. I mean, you think about what Solomon says about Him. Heaven can't contain. This universe cannot contain God. He goes outside the bounds of space, outside the bounds of time. Okay. So, God is righteous. So what? You know, that's what, when I study this, that's, that's what I sit back and say. So what? You say, well, so what? Well, if it's true of God, it's in our best interest to know it. Yeah, but why? Why does it matter to us? Look, I can come at this another way and I can say it matters because God matters. Because God is center to everything. Whether we acknowledge it or not, God is central to this universe. God is. God is the central being of everything. And so because He is, what He is matters. I mean, we can look at it like that. We can look at it from a lot of different ways. Let me tell you this. What God is matters because you're going to come face to face with God. Look, 
You know one thing that's absolutely true of every one of us in this room? You can try to hide. You can leave this place tonight and run off out here into the darkness. You can run home and you can go hide in your closet. You can run and try not to be seen by me or by others here. You can run and try to hide from people in the church. You can live a life where you're embarrassed. You can live a life where you don't want to be exposed. You can live a life where you're running from your own shadow because you're skittish, because you've got a guilty conscience, because you know that you're living wrong. You know that your life is a lie. You can try to run. You can try to hide. You can go get the sleeping bag and crawl in it and zip the zipper up. And you can find one that's got a zipper that zips all the way around it. You can go in it and you can try to hide in there and you can get in that sleeping bag and then go in your closet. Let me tell you this. Every one of us in this room, we're walking a path that's going to cross the path of God face to face. And there's no getting around it. You can run, you can hide, you can deny it, you can lie. You can try to avoid me, you can try to avoid people, but you can't avoid your meeting with God. And I'll tell you what, what He is, is going to matter. If I was here today and I was to tell you God is love, but God has no wrath in Him, He has no fury in Him, He has no anger, God never punishes sin, If that was true, that I mean, that that might cause you to reflect and th- cause you to think about what it might be like and and how uh, accountable to God you are and and what to expect when you have a meeting with Him. But let me tell you something: if I tell you that God is righteous and God is justice, God is just in His being. He is unchangeably righteous. Unchangeably does He. Pursue what is right. Just. Justice is an attribute of this God. And you are on a collision course with this God. Then I'll tell you what, it matters. It matters to you. It matters to you what that means. Because it means something. It's got something to do with the way God's going to respond to you when you come face to face with Him. It's in your best interest to know how in the world God being righteous and God being a God of justice is going to impact that meeting. And it's going to. It definitely is. (coughs) Psalm 145.17 The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. Jesus Christ. He was called the righteous. Can anybody think where He was called that? 1 John, First John chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus Christ the righteous. You know, we read that and it probably, we could say that to people. There are some of you sitting here and you're thinking, you know what? I don't even care. That doesn't even matter to me. Jesus Christ the righteous. Why do I care? I want to go out of here and have fun. Your estimation right now, life, life is just a, it's a pain. It's not very fun. You feel like you're giving a raw deal. You feel like things aren't working out for you? What in the world do you care if Jesus Christ is the righteous or if He's the unrighteous? If they ever call Him that or if they don't? People looked at Him and said, surely this was a just man. What does that mean? What in the world what in the world's that got to do with us? I'll tell you this. Your path is going to cross with this Christ, the Righteous One. Why does it matter? Because I tell you what, He's the standard. He sets the standard and He never deviates from that standard. You say, why does that matter? Because you know what man so flippantly does? Man flippantly sets up his own standard. Does he not? Man decides all the time in his own mind what is right. 
Man is a fool by nature. Man is an absolute idiot. He comes into this world and he says, you know what's right? What's right is what I can see with my eyes and what I deduce to be right and what I think is right. And so you've got men in the universities, you've got scientists, you've got men that by human estimation are very wise men, very smart men, very learned men, very knowledgeable men. But what? But what the Bible says is true and what is right and what is correct about God and what is according to His righteous standard, they look at it and they say, I don't believe that. I believe what I see, I believe what I've observed, and I believe what I think is right. You know what the Bible says? There is a way that seems right to a man. You ever hear that one? Yeah. Proverbs 16.25 There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You know what? God is righteous. God is just. And He operates according to His standard. Here's the problem. Here is the big problem. You know what you've got on a collision course? You've got man and God coming on a crossroads. They are coming. Every one of us in this room are headed for it. And you know what you've got? You've got God saying, I am the standard. My standard abides. And whoever does not meet my standard is in dire trouble. And man comes along and says, I am the standard. I declare what the standard is. I say what's right. And they're on a head on collision course. And there are some of you sitting in this room right now and you want to think that. You want to think I know what's right. And when you're talking about fools and idiots, I think you're one. And if you guys think that this Bible is true, I all the more think you're one. And you can talk about your God all you want. My God's not like that. And you see, that's exactly what man does. There is a standard there is a reality about who God is. There is a standard of righteousness by which He operates. He sets that standard. And we come along and we say, we don't like that standard. So basically what we're going to do is recreate God in our mind. We're going to recreate the way to be saved. We're going to recreate what's true. We're going to recreate the standard. And you know what? The Bible says it knows all about this. You know what? People come along and they say, there's a way that seems right to man, but What's the end of it? It's the way of death. You see, you see, folks, when you say, I'm not going to take God as the standard. I'm going to set my own standard. Guess what? Death. You don't run head on into God and live. You think you're the standard? You want to pit yourself against Him? He comes along and says, I'm the standard? I'll tell you when that collision happens, who's going to be the fatality? It's not going to be the Lord. There's a way that seems right. Boy, didn't we think we were smart when we were lost? Listen, if you're in here and you're lost and you've got your own way, you've got your own standard, there's a way that seems right to you. Look, we were there too. We were there until God graciously changed the way we see things. He opened our eyes to who He is and the fact He is the standard. He put His fear within us made us see Him for what He is, gave us, gave us that broken will to bow the knee and realize He is the standard and we are not. Listen to this. I've been, I, I've been reading Ezekiel, and so as I was thinking about there's a way that seems right, boy, I kept, I kept thinking of this, this statement that keeps coming again and again in Ezekiel. Listen to it, Ezekiel 18.25. You say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? You see, God is just. This is man's problem. Man comes along and he says, that's not fair. God isn't just. Why? Let's think of some places in the Bible where they did it. Remember Jesus told a parable? What was the parable? You got people 
And there they are, early in the morning. Guy owns a vineyard, goes out there, finds some people. Hey, come on in, work in my vineyard. They came in and worked. He went out, you know, several other times during the day until finally he went out when there was only one hour left to work and he pulls these guys in, brings them in there, and then guess what? Payday. That day, payday. A denarius. He brought in the guys that worked the hour first, gave them a denarius. Guess what? The guys he hired at the beginning of the day, he promised them a denarius, which was a day's wage. It was a good pay. But he gave the guys that came in with only the hour left, and he gave them the same amount as the guys that started early in the morning. Guess what? Men look at God and they say, it's not fair. The ways of the Lord are not fair. The ways of the Lord are not just. Man, man is constantly accusing God. That was in Ezekiel 18.25. Again, Ezekiel 33.17. Yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just when it is their own way that is not just. Ezekiel 33.20. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. O oh, house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways. I tell you what God says. We're on a collision course. And when we hit... You can say I'm not just. You guys have heard me say this before. I remember when I told my brother about the character of God and how He punished sin. I told him that some of our close family members, they died in their sin. I said, Rich, they're... God threw them into hell. Well, if that's what your God is like, you can have Him. You know what He's saying? You know what He's saying? If God is like that, I don't want a God like that. He's not fair. He's not just. He's not right. That wouldn't be right to throw our aunt and our grandfather. They were, I mean, in our estimation, they were good people. By whose standard? By ours, not by God's. You see, we don't count Him just. Why? Because we set up the standard. And when He doesn't comply with our standard, we say He's not just. But those people in Israel back then aren't the only people that do it. Folks, we have people come into our own church and when they begin to hear about the doctrines that are taught like in Romans chapter 9, that God has mercy upon whom He'll have mercy, has compassion upon whom He'll have compassion, they say, that's not fair. That's not just. I don't like a God like that. I don't like a God who determines who's going to be saved. I want a God that, you know what? It's according to my free will. I can, I can be in or I can be out based on my own. And I don't like it that God chooses to love Jacob and hate Esau. I don't like that. You see, folks, there's a way that seems right to us. We don't like it. How about this, Malachi 2.17? You have wearied the Lord with your words. What words? By asking, where is the God of justice? You see, what do men do? Men find their life gets hard and they're thinking, Lord, this isn't just. They find that things just don't go the way that they want. Well, where's the justice? And God's saying, you don't understand it. You don't understand the standard. You don't understand righteousness. And look, it's not, all, it's not always the lost people. Let me give you another example. How about Job? You guys remember Job? Job said this. Job 34, 5. I am in the right and God has taken away my right. You see, folks, the way of the Lord is not just. That's what they were saying in Ezekiel. You know what Job was saying? I lived righteous. God came along and took away my children. He took away my wealth. He took away my health. Listen to it. I, Job has said, I am in the right and God has taken away my right. What do we say to that? God is a God of justice. God is a God of righteousness. 
Let me tell you something. Job and God were on a collision course even before death. Where? The whirlwind. The tornado came. God says to him, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? This is Job 40, verse 2. He who argues with God, let him answer it. Job 40, verse 8. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Do you see what's happening here? Job put himself in the right. The Bible says God is right. God is always right. There's a way that seems right to man. Man will set himself as the standard of what is right. But God is righteous. God is just. Let me tell you this. This is why it ought to make you fear. You have a date with this God face to face. When He is going to look at you and everything is going to be weighed in the balances of justice. Everything. I can remember telling one of my friends before I moved down here about the nature of the God of the Scriptures and he said, yeah, but God's love. Meaning what? You see what people do? Folks, you may read this. God is just. God is righteous. God is a God of justice. And you may just say, it doesn't mean anything to me. Let me tell you what it ought to mean to you. It ought to mean to you that God is going to do right all the time. And never let the fact that God is love convince you that He will never do exactly what is right. For God to not do what is right would make God unrighteous and unjust. And that is absolutely inconsistent with the very character of God. Do you not see? This is what sinners don't understand. They don't understand that God must do what is consistent with His character. And His character is one of justice. You cannot ever expect God to bend His justice and His righteousness because of any other attribute. He comes face to face with one of His own beloved children, Job, and He says, will you contend with Me? Will you find fault with Me? Will you put yourself in a place where you condemn Me that you may be right? Oh, brethren, you know what Job says after he... He says, I, I put my hand on my mouth. Can I tell you what God does? God doesn't come along to Job and say, well, let me explain my righteousness to you. Let me explain my justice to you that you might learn and logically deduce that I'm in the right. I'm always in the right because I am a God of right. Do you know what He does? He doesn't explain the rightness of His actions in taking away Job's children. So that Job can just simply understand how God's actions were right. You know what he does? He tells... Have you guys ever read Job? He doesn't come in and say, listen, I'm always right. He says, Job... Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like His? Folks, were any of you awake the other night when that thunderstorm passed through? That lightning and thunder were terrifying. That is just a glimpse of the power of God. You come face to face with a God that is that fearful and awesome. He basically comes before Job and he doesn't explain himself. He just says, Job, 
Do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like His? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? You see what he does? He comes to Job and he tells him about his majesty and about his power. Let me tell you this. God does not need to explain the rightness of His actions to Job or to anybody. God is righteous and He does not have to defend Himself. And He does not go to Job and explain the rightness of... He doesn't go to him and say, well, look Job, it actually was right that I took your children away from you. I mean, it was right because of... He says, Job, Were you there when I created the oceans? Were you there when I told them to go that far and no further? Job, were you there? When the snow falls, do you know where it comes from? When the birds do this and the animals do that? When the hail falls, Job, were you there? We have a meeting with a God that sent down that crashing thunder. One of those claps of thunders was fearful. You're going to come face to face with this God and rise. think you're going to rise up and say, God, you're not just. Let me tell you something. I went through and I looked up this basic word in all of the Hebrew places and all of the Greek places. Just shy of about 300 usages throughout the Scriptures, do you know what comes at us over and over and over again? Do you know how the justice and the righteousness of God are connected so often in Scripture? They're connected with judgment. Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time, it was after the hail fell in Egypt, I have sinned. The Lord is in the right. There's our word. He's in the right. And I and my people are in the wrong. Judgment. Hail fell. And Pharaoh said God was right. I'll tell you this, the day is coming when you're going to meet God head on. And whether you say it right now or not, you're going to admit God is right. Folks, you know what Job said in the end? Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. You know, this is basically where where Paul comes from in Romans 9. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice? There it is. On God's part, by no means. Let me tell you, no matter how something may look in Scriptures, it may appear unjust if God's involved with it, if it's according to His ways or according to His laws, according to His actions, according to anything that He carries out, according to His will in any manner, shape, form, or fashion. Be certain of this. There is no injustice in it. It may seem unjust to us, but it is not. He has mercy on whomever He wills. He hardens whomever He wills. You will say to me then, why does He still find fault? Who can resist His will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? And that, folks, is the bottom line. God is right, and who are you to answer back to God? Now look, that doesn't mean that there's not a place to go to God and ask God for clarity in our ignorance. But when we find fault and we want to charge God with fault, you know what? You need to put your hand on your mouth. 
Say among the nations, Psalm 96.10, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. Now listen to this. For He comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. There's our word, righteousness. Judgment and righteousness of God are attached over and over and over and over. Why? Because that is where the rightness, the justice of God is going to be so clearly seen on Judgment Day. God is going to judge according to what's right. Now listen to me. This is where men err. They think God can somehow, because He's gracious, and He is, He's love, and He is, He's merciful, He is, gentle, yes, long-suffering, compassionate, yes, full of pity, yes. But they think because those attributes are tr true that somehow Somehow, God is not just. And somehow, sin can just be swept under the rug. Let me tell you this. You basically know what happens. You can, you can follow this with me. You know, a little guy has a parent tell him, you better not lie. You've seen Pinocchio. You lie, your nose is going to grow long. They lie, and their nose doesn't grow long. And so what? I mean, they realize their parents weren't telling the truth. They realize that, well, the consequences that their parents told them would come didn't come. Or we can tell our children sometimes, you know, if you lie, you're going to get in trouble. Or you might teach your children, you don't want to have premarital sex because all these horrible things are going to happen and they do it and actually they enjoyed it and all the horrible things that their parents told them would happen, they don't see happen immediately. And so they think, well, and, and you know, you know what the scripture says? In Ecclesiastes 8.11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Now, did you guys catch that? You know what it says? Because when men sin, lightning doesn't just flash out of the sky and kill them on the spot. They become bold in their wickedness. You see, because they sin once and no lightning, they sin again. It's kind of like the Pinocchio thing, right? You lie, go look in the mirror, it didn't grow. Lie again, go look in the mirror, it didn't grow. You see, because, because the consequences of sin don't come immediately, man gets bold. You know what? Because sin isn't executed immediately, men begin to think God isn't just. Oh, I'll tell you this. God is never going to not be God because you think He ought not to be the way He is. God isn't in the day of judgment not going to be God and He's not going to change any of His attributes just because you thought He was unfair. I tell you, when you come face to face with God, you're going to come face to face with Him as He is. And He is a God of justice. He is a God of righteousness. And in the day He comes face to face with you, all will be set right. 
Do not think that because he is love, because he is compassionate, because he is tender, that he is somehow going to bend his justice to conform to you and slip you in the door somehow contrary to his character. It's not going to happen. And don't you dare think that because you've gotten away with sin as long as you have, that somehow God on that day is going to just sweep. So you get. The sinner gets that idea. The sinner gets the idea because they haven't yet been punished. God is just all the time forgetting their sin. All the time moving it under the rug. Let me tell you, it's not happening. That is not the case, folks. Don't think that. Don't believe that. Listen to this. Psalm 7.11 God is a righteous judge. There's our righteousness attached to Him being a judge. He is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Let me tell you something. You sin today, God is indignant with you today. Don't think because He doesn't exact punishment upon you today. Don't think because that storm came the other day and the lightning didn't strike you to death that somehow God is all happy with you and somehow everything's right with God. It's amazing, folks. How often people think that because sin isn't exacted right away. And not only that, not only that, it isn't just that the sinner sins and then waits and nothing happens. Is that the sinner sins and even more than that, dinner's on the table that night. He not only didn't get struck dead, God let His rain fall on him and gave him food. And men are all the more emboldened. Oh, well, certainly God gave me health. God saved me from the wreck. That must mean everything's okay with me and God. Don't you believe it? God is indignant. Why? Because He's righteous. Do you know the massive problem, folks, And I know many of you have heard this before, but the massive problem in Scripture is not how God can damn sinners. That is in perfect accord with His righteousness. The great problem of Scripture is how God can be a friend of and make children out of ungodly wretches like us. Because for Him to be righteous, He must punish every single sin. And this is what man forgets. Man looks at his sin as small. God feels indignation for every sin committed by every person every single time. And when that God comes face to face with the sinner, there is hell to pay. The real issue of the Scriptures is how a just God can continue to be just and save sinners. And of course, that is the great dilemma that is dealt with in Romans chapter 3. And that's why it says it this way. Romans 3.25, there's Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation, a wrath absorber by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now if you didn't get all that, it basically means this. At the time Christ went to the cross, there were already Old Testament saints who had been forgiven. David had already been forgiven. Remember when Nathan came? Said, David, thou art the man. And he said, you won't die. Your sin has been put away. And do you remember the psalm that came out of that? What is it? Psalm 32? Blessed is that man whose sins are forgiven, folks whose unrighteous deeds are not held against Him. How can that be? How, how could Abraham have been justified by faith and already been with the Lord? 
How can that be? God passed over sins. And I'll tell you what, if God had not put Christ on the cross, He would have been unjust. There had to be a penalty paid. God will punish every single sin. And if you think you're going to get to God on Judgment Day and your sin's just going to be pardoned and pushed under the rug, you are dead wrong. Every sin you've ever committed must be by a just God punished fully. And it will be punished in you or it will be punished in Christ. And if you stand there on that day and you have Christ not as a Savior, if you are not under the blood, if you come before God outside of Christ, you are going to find that God is going to be exactly just with you. Exactly. He will require payment. Jesus Christ said, you will give an account for every idle word you've spoken. You will be held accountable for every slightest, small, misspoken word, misthought, flash of mind in your head, you will be held accountable. And you will pay the price in full. And God will deal with you according to justice. And every single sin, we are told, is falling short of the glory of God. Every sin you commit is a stab at His glory. And the very God against whom's glory you stabbed, you you basically trampled. You counted as a, as a little thing. You counted as an obscene thing. You counted as a vain thing, a trivial thing. That God, in perfect, exact, righteous justice, I mean pristine, white, glowing justice, is going to require of you every sin. It's going to fall on your head. And if you think God's just going to push it under the rug because He is a gracious God, a merciful God, let me tell you something, you misunderstand God. You misunderstand His attribute. The glory of the cross of Jesus Christ is that sin was punished on that cross. It is that every sin of all of God's people was punished to the fullest. The full extent of justice was taken care of there. It was paid in full. This is how God might be just. There's our word. He might remain just. You see, God had to do what God had to do to remain just. Why? Because it's His attribute. You cannot change it. God is unchanging. God is who He is. He must remain just. That means if He's ever going to pardon a sin, He must figure out. He must have a plan. He must have a way. He must have a scheme. He must have decreed some way by which He can keep being just and yet justify one who by nature is not just. How do you justify one who isn't just? Listen to this. Nahum 1.3 The Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. What does that mean? The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Don't we see that guilty sinners are set free? How is it that in one place the Bible says He will by no means clear the guilty, and if he's just, if he's righteous, then he must by no means clear the guilty. Why? Because every sin of which guilt, if you're talking guilt, guilt implies sin. Guilt implies a law has been broken. Every law that's broken, what does the law demand? The law demands a penalty be paid. There's a price to be paid. That price is death. The full punishment. He will by no means clear the guilty. If the Bible in one place says He by no means clears the guilty, and then in other places we find that guilty, ungodly people somehow... Does the Bible not say that He justifies the ungodly? It certainly does. In Romans chapter 4, how in the world can God justify the ungodly? How can He declare a wicked man righteous? How can He... It says by no means clear the guilty, and yet He clears the guilty. Either the, What's wrong here? Is there a contradiction in Scripture? 
Brethren, this is the glory of the gospel. He who knew no sin became sin. The guilt of sin was laid on him. He became guilty. God needed to do that in order to remain just. Look, every one of us in this room have a date, a time. It's appointed. You're going to die. Then as Hebrews 9.27 says, and then the judgment. Every one of us in this room has an appointment with Him who is just. And He is going to reward you exactly according to what you deserve. He's not going to bend the rule in the least. And the only way a sinner can come before Him and find that an exactly perfectly just God can deal with the sinner in that day in a way that will not require your damnation is if in all of His justice your sin was fully paid by Jesus Christ. There is no other way. We got too many people walking around thinking the ways of the Lord are unfair. But I'll tell you what, it's perfectly fair for God to throw sinners into hell. Perfectly fair. And what God worked out is a way for Him to remain just, remain fair, remain a God of justice, remain a God who is righteous, and yet take the guilty and find a way to pardon them and make them His children. That way is through the cross. Christ had to become a propitiation, a wrath bearer. God is full of indignation every day. Remember, He's righteous. He's a righteous judge. He views men. He sees their sin. He's full of indignation. You know what propitiation is? It is a turning of that indignation away from us into Christ. He took the blow. He took the indignation. It's got to happen. Every sin, there's indignation. There's a cup of indignation that must be drank. You drink it, or Christ drinks it. Justice demands it. If you get to the end, if there's any of you hearing my voice, you get to the end of the life, you've basically spurned Christ, voided the cross, and you've just kind of laid it up that you're going to get in somehow, some way it's just going to work out in the end. You're a fool. Because what you're doing is denying who God is. And in that day, you won't deny who He is then. All you'll be able to do is cover your mouth. Because you know what? It's going to be like it was with Job. Job saw Him. Job heard His words. Job didn't need an explanation at that point as to why God was righteous to take His children away. He didn't need it. He took one look at Him. He heard His voice. That was enough. He says, I repent in dust and ashes. Do you know God never did explain why He took His children away? God never did explain why He took His wealth away, why He took His health away. And I'll tell you this, He doesn't need to explain to us why He does the things He does. I can guarantee you, what He does is righteous. What He does is just. And that day, none of us are going to be able to find fault. Will, any comments, observations? The Holiness of God, what by R.C. Sproul? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Even though we weren't speaking about the holiness, um, obviously there's a close association between the holiness and the justice of God. God is holy in all of His attributes, which means He's totally separate. He's totally unlike us in all of His attributes. There is a holiness that 
makes him unlike all others. He alone is holy, holy, holy. I have a question. His righteousness and His holiness, how were declared righteous? Is that, that, is that a communicable attribute? <coughs> declared righteous? We're given that righteousness? Could, could that be? Well, this is in the section of communicable attributes. So, it, you know, the, your theologians put it there because they would say, yes, it's man has the capabilities of justice. Man has capabilities of righteousness. Um, but like I said before, all, even what we consider to be communicable attributes of God, they're unique to God in that He is infinite. He is eternal and He is unchangeable. And in all three of those ways, we are not like Him. He is entirely holy in those areas, entirely separate from us. He knows of a, a righteousness and a justice that entirely surpasses what we can be and can know. Righteousness in the same way that we receive the love. Can we receive righteousness? Now understand that when it talks about righteousness there, it's talking about what is right. I mean, that's what we're speaking about. We're speaking well, about... Because in God's sight, I know that when we, when we are saved, we are pretty much just like the act of being declared righteous. In His sight, we're declared you know, blameless in His sight because of Christ and His finished work. Um, what I'm asking is if, is if love is uh, given in the same manner that, that this is, you know, without us, without us attaining it on our own, obviously. Um, love is shown to us by God. And we would not know it if He had not first shown it to us. I mean, God shows that love to us, but it's... See, with righteousness, I don't think we would want to categorize righteousness and love in the same category in the, in the sense of... I mean, think with me here. Righteousness is basically in one standpoint is an imputed, you're, you're speaking about an imputed righteousness. Basically, that is a legal declaration. God justifies the ungodly. Why? Not because of righteousness in them, because they're ungodly. They have none. Where does the righteousness come from? We read about the Gospel in it is revealed the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God in Romans 3 is said to be for those who believe in Christ. It is a righteousness of God. It is His standard of righteousness. His standard by which anybody can be accepted into His presence. He declares the standard. Thus, the righteousness of God, the righteous standard of God, it is a righteousness by the obedience of one. What is it about? Romans 5.19? By the obedience of one, the many are declared righteous. He obeys, we are declared righteous. Now, when, when we are talking about the righteousness of God, we're obviously not talking about an imputed righteousness. We're not talking about God having a righteousness that came from some other place, or as some like to call it, an alien righteousness. What we're talking about is an actual righteousness. This is actually how He is. Which would be more in line, if we're talking about a communicable attribute, would be more in line with the practical righteousness that we have as believers. Not so much the imputed righteousness, or that which is legally bestowed to us, but that righteousness would be more consistent with the things that we read about in the New Covenant, such as the law of God being written on our heart, a new heart being given to us, the Spirit of God being put within us, by the Spirit of God putting to death the deeds of the body, practicing righteousness. But you, you have a practical righteousness that we actually live out, which is increasingly coming into the to conforming image of Jesus Christ 
versus that immediately perfect imputed righteousness. So you have one that's legal, one that's practical. Where love, you know, love is never spoken about in those two different ways. Love would be more like, um, it wouldn't be like the imputed sense, it would be like the practical sense. Where a Christian can demonstrate justice